Well, hi there. Thanks for finding the Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas here on YouTube. If you want more, you can just go to any podcast channel and find the show or go to lucydumascoaching.com, Lucy with an I, to learn more about me and to listen to shows. And thank you for subscribing, sharing with your friends, and I hope you enjoy. Bye for now. Hello, welcome back to The Profitable Photographer. This is Lucy. I have an invitation for you before we get started. If you are going to WPPI in Las Vegas this year, uh, and it starts weekend after next, I would love to meet up with you. So you can send me a message either from Facebook, Lucy Dumas, Lucy with an I, or you can send me an email, Lucy with an I at lucydumas.com. On the Tuesday, I'm planning either to have a lunch meetup and we could do a little guided walkthrough of the print exhibit or meet for coffee at the Starbucks at four. Or if you can't do that, we might be able to just find a time to meet each other in person. So please let me know if you're going to be there and also, join my Facebook group. The private group is The Profitable Photographer. The public page is The Profitable Photographer dash Lucy Dumas or dash page. <laughs> I have to look that up, but I just wanted to give you that little quick heads up before we get started with an amazing interview with one of my favorite people in the world. It is during our darkest moments that we must focus to see the light. And that's by Aristotle. And you will learn once I introduce Tony Corbell to you why I picked that for today's quote. So I can't really express to you how excited and delighted I am to have my friend Tony as my guest today. We have been pals for umpteen years. That's an official number. <laughs> and, you know, I don't know. Tony, if I've ever had the blessing of an uninterrupted hour with just you and I, especially talking about photography. So uh. <laughs> this interview is a gift to me, but uh, dear listeners, you're welcome to listen in, but this one's for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lucy. I'm just I'm delighted. Yeah. Well, you know, I just heart you so much. So a little about the amazing and wonderful Tony Corbell. To say he's had an interesting career is an understatement. In more than 38 years, he's photographed some of the most recognizable faces, including three presidents, world leaders at the United Nations, which that's a whole story in itself. It's so amazing. Fashion models, celebrities, NASA astronauts, and much, much more. He has photographed or taught photographic technical skills over 700 times in more than 20 countries, as well as in all 50 states. He has taught on the PPA education program, on Kelby One, on Creative Live. He's got two books published with Amherst Media, one called Light and one called Shadow. And just in case you haven't met him yet, when you do, you'll quickly discover he is the biggest Beatles fan ever. <laughs> <laughs> so best of all, I'm blessed to call this amazing man my friend. So welcome, Tony. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. It, I, was, I was thinking when I, when I last bumped into you on the road, it seemed like I was, I was trying to think of when we met, and I think it was late 1985. I'm thinking it was like October or November of 1985. So, yeah. So we've known each other a while. <laughs> Long time. And then when you moved to San Diego. <laughs> That's it. That's right. You know, then it blossomed. And yeah. something, you know, if you become a friend of Tony's, then you're a friend of everybody he knows. Because he takes the time to introduce you and he brags about you in a way that even your mother wouldn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just, boy, I do. I do. Uh, I love to collect friends. And, uh, and I love it when my friends know my friends, you know? Right. Yep. <laughs> so, and I love that about you. It's fun. So, 
yeah, we could just chat and glow and everything, but I think, you know, we might want to talk about some actual stuff. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. the first thing is you mentioned to me before we got started that your start in photography is a little bit different than most people that you and I know. So tell me about that. Well, it's it's a little weird because most people that I know and most most photographers I don't know that are working today or or even even hobbyists started with photography as a great passion as an amateur photographer as someone who just loved the art and science of photography for me I never had a camera I never had a desire to be a photographer I I was never the high school senior yearbook photographer I nothing I I got a phone call from my sister's husband one day I was working in El Paso, Texas at a TV station and I got a phone call from my sister's husband who said, why don't you move out here to San Angelo, Texas? He said, I think you might make a decent photographer and I just bought this studio I've been working for. And I was, you know, early 20s kid scratching my head going, okay, I'll try that. And he didn't let me shoot for a long time. And the first picture I took was actually for a paying client. Wow. I sat, I sat in the back of his dark studio room in the camera room and I watched him for three months before he let me uh, take a picture. And uh, that was it. That's, that's how my career started. It, wow. it, I, it, I started as a working pro. <laughs> I never was an amateur. <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool. Pretty and, interesting. Uh, pretty different. Interesting. And that you're still at it. So obviously it's something that became a passion and an art and, you know, the, a love of, of teaching others. It was, it was a pretty short period of time before I figured out that, that I really did love this and it was something I really wanted to spend my life doing. Yes. It was probably two or three months into it when I, when I started hitting my stride a little bit and the work started getting a lot better and more people were noticing what I was doing. And, and it's, and it just seemed like that I kind of got on a bit of a roll for, you know, the first little while. And, and I knew this is what I was going to be doing. So, yeah. So this isn't our necessarily topic du jour, but I'm sure people would love to know a little bit about how you ended up photographing prominent leaders and celebrities, et cetera. Like in just a little nutshell, can you share how that path unfolded? You know, none of it was, I didn't go search for it or market for it or outreach for that work. They all came in in an individual thing. In other words, when I, when I got the UN shoot, that was from a reference from a referral from our friend Terry Daglow from Eastman Kodak. Mm. Uh, when I photographed Bush the first time, it was because I knew the president of the Petroleum Museum in West Texas. And so when Bush came to town, I, I was the guy that got called to go photograph him at this museum. Well, after that, he and I hit it off. And so for the next few years, I photographed him a number of times, but it was never anything that I went looking for. I mean, it just sort of often fell in my lap, you know? Um, so it was, yeah, it's always been real interesting how that all came about. I would think, Tony, because you are a person who connects with people so easily and collects true friends, that that probably helped that because you know, people refer people that they like and trust. Would you think that's probably one of the secrets? Yeah, I think it is. And I think, I think you hit on the word trust. The celebrity people that I have photographed know that I have never released or sold any of their pictures to be used in a way other than they would want or without their permission. I photographed Hillary Clinton's campaign four years back, uh, the, the time before last. And I've got a collection of pictures called the many faces of Hillary that are in a folder that are just outrageously funny, but I would never do anything with those pictures. You know, I, I can't, I would never publish those or sell those to the Enquirer or, or someone like that. Right. Because I mean, I might make a couple of dollars, but I'll never work again. And those, those type of leaders and those kind of people would never call me back. Right. And uh, so, you know, you got to keep your nose clean and, and go through this thing you know, with, with quality job one. So. Right. I haven't had a lot of celebrities. I've had a few celebrity clients and the Mickelson family, Phil Mickelson, the golfer. Sure, sure. I was their family photographer for eight years 
And the way I got the job is that she had had someone else do portraits, ask her not to use their images, and someone saw their photos on display at a trade show. And so besides being brokenhearted because of the trust was broken, then she was in search of a new photographer. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and especially when that's where, where there's a family involved or personal pictures involved, you know, now, now you're talking about someone's family and their children and, you know, their likeness is out there and they didn't put it out there. So. Right. Right. You're yourself in real trouble with that. Yeah. I'm guessing also the fact that you teach so extensively gets you in the public eye and gives you much more credibility in the eyes of people who need a true professional to hire. You know, it, it's true. And, and there's a lot of people that have called for different things. I got a job photographing uh, pretty well-known authors, family and uh, he's in, lives in Beverly Hills and he's you know, New York Times bestselling. I'll, you'd know his name if I mentioned it. But as a result of his assistant finding me, I then photographed his family at their home in Beverly Hills and in uh, Santa Fe. And I did, and I photographed two weddings of his kids in, nice. one in Beverly Hills and one in San Francisco. And nobody's seen that work. I can't show that work off. Right. And I wouldn't. It's, this was for them. <laughs> so what I'm getting at is to plant the seed with the listeners that speaking and being of service to our industry can actually have payoffs. I know when I became president of the local PPSDC, suddenly, A, I had that credibility and my business grew quickly. And part of it, I think, is whenever we give, we get, but also because it gave me more visibility out in the world. I think, I think that's true. I think as long as you're, as long as you're giving for the right reason, if you're, if you're doing it for the purpose of trying to get ahead, it, it sometimes will come back to haunt you. <laughs> right. You know? So, Tony, all that aside, I want to get into the meat of, of the topics for today. So, you are the lighting guru. Anyone who knows you or anyone who knows this industry knows you're, you're the go-to guy if they want to learn more about lighting, particularly, you know, using studio lighting and et cetera is what I've enjoyed learning from you. So why do you think it's important to the profitable photography goals to learn what it is that is your, your superpower, your zone of genius? Talk to me about that. I think, I think that, you know, people come to a working photographer for a number of reasons. Most of the clients that come to you are not coming to you because you're a great photographer. They're coming to you because they have a connection with you. Someone referred them to you. You're local or easy to get to. There's a lot of reasons why clients come to you for the work. But when they do come to you for the work, you've got to be able to perform on demand and not fumble with your equipment, not fumble with the lighting, not scratch your head and wonder where that button is that changes the ISO. <laughs> Yeah, you've got you've got to be so well versed in your technique and your technical skills that the photographic and lighting techniques are a given. And then you can just relax and enjoy the connection with your client while you're shooting as opposed to fighting and wrestling around trying to figure out what to do or how to fix that problem or boy, where's that shadow coming from? Or what's that highlight back there from? You better get all that figured out long before you uh, before you get on set with a client or, or stop worrying about how to add another zero to your pricing, which is what everybody mm. wants. Uh, right. But I think for me, it was always about those foundational skills. I didn't, my, my skills were pretty average and my work was average. I was still buying houses and cars. I had a business. I had a profitable business, but I wasn't very good. And I know I wasn't very good. And then I started studying. And I started studying and I studied harder and harder. And pretty soon, you know, I got picked up by Dean Collins, as you know, and moved to San Diego to, to work harder and study more about light and teach more about light. And, uh, and at the time that I started teaching, you know, all about light theory and light te lighting techniques, there wasn't really anybody teaching that much. Uh, Dean had retired from teaching. 
and there really wasn't anybody else out there doing it. And uh, we all sort of got our heads together and felt that somebody's got to be doing this and somebody better be talking about it because at the time nobody was. And so I just kind of made that a, a goal for me personally to really fine tune my teaching skills and create a situation where any question that comes up from the audience hopefully gets answered with the next slide that's on the screen. Mm. In other words, I think through all of my techniques that I'm teaching so well that, that if you've got a question on your mind that pops up because of something I'm talking about or showing you, whatever your question is, I think I've got it answered in the next, in the next sentence. I, I work pretty hard on, on doing it that way. I'm sorry, you learned what? I learned, I learned to, to produce those shows in such a way and to, and to produce my slideshows in such a way that in lighting, especially, whatever question pops up in your mind, I, I've got it answered with the next slide. Ah. So that being said, can you, using just words and not slides, <laughs> give us three or four tips or things that can be takeaways that the listener can, without even seeing it, can have Absolutely. like... Absolutely. Uh -huh. so, so number one would be what? Well, I think there's four types of, of applications of light. And what I mean by that is light can be one of four things. It can be additive. It can be subtractive. It can be reflective. And it can be diffused. Mm. So you've got these four lighting applications in your, in your brain. Now, add to that the four lighting tools in your brain, and that is sunlight, speed light, studio lighting, and ambient light. So you, you pick one application of light and one tool of light, and that's what makes up a picture. And every one of us that have ever taken a picture have had one from column A and one from column B. Right. So what is ambient light? Anything. It can be, it can be a, a set of car headlights bouncing off of a white building at night. It can be the, a screen, a white screen in a slideshow. It can be a candle inside a chapel. It can be an LED light bounced off of a, a white reflector. It can be any kind of ambient or consistent light that's just in the area. Okay. So light that's just hanging around. Think about <laughs> photographing a small child opening a refrigerator at night at midnight. Looking right. for a snack. Right. That's a perfect example of ambient light. Spectacular light. You just didn't even know what to do with it. Yes. So, for example doing a wedding where let's say it's the altar photographs where you must have some kind of strobe or continuous light or something mm -hmm. beyond the ambient, but you can also enhance the image by using that ambient light. Sure. You know, slowing down the shutter speed. So you gather more of the light that's already there to add to the quality. Yeah, and I think that goes to the, it's funny, it's funny, there's so much talk nowadays about off-camera flash, and, it, and I don't know why they seem to think it's brand new. We've been doing it for 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but uh, for me, it's always been about finding the ambient exposure first. What, what do you want the, let, let's, let's call it the background, what do you want the background brightness to be? Truly what it is, or brighter than it truly is, or darker than it truly is? Once you decide that, then the next decision is, okay, well, then, then you, I, I came up with a little phrase a, a while back with uh, a, a local friend of mine up here in Oklahoma, and we came up with a phrase that's called expose for the place, then light the face. Mm. And so if I can I expose it. for the place and expose for that ambient light first, then I'll light the face to suit the needs of the client or the needs of the job. Perfect. Make sense? Yes. Last night at our local meeting, John Marillis, you know, John? Oh, sure. I love John. He gave a talk and he's been around a while. And he said, when I did weddings, I used a potato masher. And I asked my friend who's been doing weddings about 10 years, do you know what a potato masher is? <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> so I used to have this um, and, and I had, I can't remember, was it Metz? Probably uh, a Met 60 CT4. Yeah. So I never had that, you know, that was the Cadillac, but I had another, it's a, 
so it's there's a flash on the head and then you have a bar that you hold yeah. um, and mine had a built-in sink so that I could hold it off camera or I could have my assistant at a wedding hold it a little ahead of me off to the side so that my flash on camera which was a Vivitar 285 and the potato masher would add enough light because at the time the ISO when I started was 100 that was the film we used and then they came up with 200 and then 400 that was awesome <laughs> anyway it's true. So, it's true. yes so something I think and I think I don't always think about this so of course I think about either adding light or using light that's available because I love to find light but the subtractive part i think that's where the rubber meets the road of understanding and using subtractive can you talk about that i, I can uh, think about uh you know a lot of people are already using subtractive light and they don't even know it yes if you if you're photographing a family of five and you put them on the front porch of their home you're using the overhang of the roof to sort of subtract light off the top of their head so to speak Right, which is highly recommended. <laughs> well, yeah, and in doing so, you're, you're forcing the light to come from a direction uh, that's not straight down. So I use, I use subtractive light all the time. There's plenty of light almost every situation. It's just in the wrong place, and it's coming from the wrong direction often. And instead of, you know, there, you can always bounce it, and you can always add light to it. You can always uh, diffuse light. But by subtracting light, I found that you can you can create a a much more elegant picture with just a little bit of effort taking light away from where you don't need it, mm -hmm. and it's so simple to do. Everybody's got those five in one, six in one, you know, Westcott pop up reflector things, and everybody uses the white and the silver and the gold and the reflectives, you know, all, but nobody uses the black very much. I use the black more than anybody I know, mm. and often I'll bring it in next to the face, even closer, 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 closer just to create a shadow on one side of the face. Yeah. If I'm in a situation where there's a lot of ambient light that I'm going to utilize, I want to take light away just to force it to make it appear directionally. Right. I know, like it was pretty mind-blowing early on when I was learning how to use window light and let's say you were going to include part of the window in the photograph and use it as your main light, that somebody taught me if I was going to use any reflector to fill in shadow, let's say the, the windows on the left, don't put a big old reflector on the right because that's going to fill in all the shadow detail. Right. If you need to fill in a little shadow, put it on the same side as the window. This is such a great point you just made. And so few people know about that. It's such a great technique. And it, and it does a couple of things. That's really great. One, if it's on the same side as the window, not only does it give you just the right amount of, of shadow fill, but it also acts as a gobo for your lens. Yeah. So you don't get that flare. <laughs> so, you know? Yeah. So when I'm thinking about that, I'm also thinking how a scrim or a black could also enhance that. So sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So Tony, I do a, um, a class I call go towards the light. Mm -hmm. And I photographed my Barbie because I love natural light and not the oh, go out in the field, hope it's an overcast day, take a bunch of pictures, call it natural light. <laughs> right, but right. I love finding and using natural light and those principles of finding those natural, you know, blocks to light, like you just mentioned, the porch. Sure. And sure. it's amazing how Barbie looks like she's had a rough night and has a hangover when I put her in light that is not ideal <laughs> and because I have an older shifty eyed Barbie from like a long time ago and then when I put her in good light she looks like someone I'd want to have as a best friend and it's all just light so <laughs> I, I often do demonstrations if, if I've got the time and I'm in a location that works where I teach a whole segment on garage door lighting yes well that's my jam garage, garage door lighting is nothing more than subtractive light it's you you are subtracting ambient light and pushing it to a, a direction 
you know, think about stepping out on the driveway, even on an overcast day, that light is still downward casting. It still creates deep eye sockets and deep shadows under the nose, under the chin. Mm -hmm. But if you step, you know, even five, six feet with your subject into a garage with the garage door open, you got something working now. Right. (laughs) You know? I call it the first tree in the forest, which I learned that phrase from somebody a long time ago that, you know, if you have a bank of trees, you don't want to go thick in, in the forest. You want the first tree and maybe you are even standing in the sunshine and the subject is just fully under, under the tree. That's a great Um, way to describe it. Yeah. I start my class with a story about somebody that finds herself with a camera and a subject on a planet that has nothing and the sun never goes down. So there's never sweet light, but she can ask for whatever she wants that does not come from like a camera store or any purchase thing. You know, what would you want? And after people think about it, eventually I say a forest, a garage or a cave, same thing, a window, a hallway and a wall. You know, and those are things that are going to provide the additive and the subtractive all at once. And they're available to us free. Right. (laughs) They're out there. Right. (laughs) And they have amazing recycle time. (laughs) Right. And for me, because I love photographing kids and technology is not my favorite thing in the world. I, you know, I can, I can work my way around the studio just fine or, you know, off camera flash and so forth, but I love finding the light. And with kids, it's so much easier for me because I just put them in a target rich environment with, sure. with beautiful light. And then I guide them to be doing certain things within that frame, but I never have to move a light. Oh, wait, no, you've moved, you've moved away. You know, now I've got to change my, my F stop and, yeah, I like the simplicity that works for me. But at the same time, I love watching you teach, you know, and, and working with, with studio lights. You know, when you, I think you were doing tours with ProPhoto or? Yeah. 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 And in fact, we're, we're, we're lining up uh, 24 cities right now mm. toward the end of, uh, well, mid, mid-year to late year 2020. We're going to do a, a nice 24 city. So will that be... If somebody emails you will, or goes to your website, will they be able to get notified of your tour? Oh, yeah. Good, sure. good, good. We'll get into that later, but I just wanted a little, of people are thinking, how can I find out about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So do you have another tip on how to create beautiful light? I think one of the, one of the driving, I guess, prevailing tips that I keep in my head all the time when I'm working is that, you know, the size, the size of any given light source is such an important part of the construction of a photograph, Mm. whether it's a portrait, a fashion shoot, whatever it is, a commercial shoot of food, it can be anything, but there's something about understanding that the size of the light source is directly relative to its distance to the subject. That sentence is etched in my forefront of my brain. And I, and I use that sentence every time I take a picture. So, so I'm looking at highlights and shadows that are controllable with every picture I take. You know, it's funny, but your friend and mine, Dean Collins, one of the things I learned from Dean was the studying of Da Vinci and some of the others and, and really break down technical terms, not just the art terms, but the technical terms of what it was that they did. Mm. And Da Vinci made the comment that, in order to produce depth in a painting, you have to have three separate brightness levels. One being the true brightness of the subject, one being a brightness which is brighter than that true brightness, and one is a brightness darker than that true subject. Well, he told us we need highlights and shadows, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to have the true brightness of our subject, whatever that level of brightness is. And we have to have highlights and shadows, which are a direct result of uh, directional light, first off, but then we can control the brightness or the density of the highlight. We can control the brightness or the density of the shadow. We can, we can control and produce a hard edge shadow or a soft edge shadow. We have complete control over everything about the highlights and shadows. 
And it almost always comes back to size of source is related and directly relative to its size relative to its distance to the subject. Yeah, I remember I, I did get to spend a week with Dean in his San Diego studio with a group at West Coast School. And I remember him saying that. And I remember after an evening shoot and a picnic and it was pitch black and he took a flashlight and a pie tin and a subject and totally blew my mind and informed me about not only that topic, but also short light, broad light, flat light, just with putting a, you know, a pie tin uh, (laughs) and a person. The other thing I learned, because he was a commercial photographer, at four in the morning at a bar with a motorcycle and a bunch of equipment and stuff, I learned I did not want to be a commercial photographer. <laughs> right. It takes a long time to pack when you finish a shoot. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So I have one other question on this topic. Do you think if people are going to use strobes or flash of any kind that they need a meter and why or why not a handheld meter? I've probably been responsible for the more, more sales of more light meters than anybody in the world. I have pounded and pounded on the importance of a light meter for so many years. And then three years ago, I got my hands on the first TTL studio light that actually worked. Mm. When I say it worked, what I mean by that is it worked not just adequately, but absolutely flawlessly perfect in its exposure. And it's because of a technology that came out that literally is called pre-flash. That there's a pre-flash before the studio flash with TTL fires. There's a pre-flash that basically is reading how much light is hitting the subject. What's the brightness level of the subject? And does it need a little bit more light or a little bit less light? And it's figuring all that out in about four milliseconds. And so when you pull the trigger on TTL at that time, you get a pretty dead on exposure and it doesn't matter if it's a African American woman in a white bridal gown or a Asian woman with a green dress. It doesn't matter. It finds that exposure and it finds it truly and accurately. So I can see how that would be amazing if you happen to have that equipment right? to get the, the, the strobe or the flash right. But how do you, how would you know the right ambient light and all the other things without just sort of like taking a shot, looking, taking a shot, looking like, isn't it really? You still have to have a light meter. Okay, good. The the world, the world of metering, I've still got my, my, my Sekonic L758 DR, which I think is the greatest meter in the world. And I've dropped this thing. This thing's eight years old. I've dropped it. I've kicked it. It's been in the sand. It's fallen off of a stone mountain, Georgia. Wow. It's, it's traveled the world with me. And I, don't, I can't even believe that it still works. So why do we still need a meter with technology being what it is? Because there are instances where I can't get to the area where the exposure needs to be correct. Right. I think also when you said early on in this conversation that when you show up for a job, you want to look like the professional and, you know, not just be the professional. (laughs) And I know when I've forgotten a meter and I really needed to add some strobe, it's like hit or miss. It's like making soup rather than baking, you know, a little of this, a little that. Do I like it? Don't I like it? Eh, eh, eh. And one review I got on Yelp, which was actually the teenage daughter, but, I was in that position and I spent time trying to get the light and I needed additive light. It was at the beach. It was really gray and I did not look professional. The clients Mm -hmm. were happy, but the Yelp comment that the teenager made was, you know, she kept, I don't know, something, you know, about, I didn't just show up do my metering, know what I wanted take a test. You know, I was chimping basically, you know, we're not perfect. I'm never perfect, 
eventually the mom got her to take down the Yelp review because she was really happy with the results. But it's good to know what we're doing and to look like it, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You, you know, you have to, you know, that old, I love that TV commercial for, I don't know, one of the anti-deodorant soaps or whatever. You can't ever let them see a sweat. Exactly. You, you cannot look anything less than professional or you've just put yourself in the same category as those who are not professional. Right. Don't think people aren't watching because they are. Yes. So I know you love to talk about ultimate quality and I, I'm sure we are in total agreement that knowing how to properly light subjects is a part of it. But tell me more about that. Why, you know, why is that a, a concept that you think is ultimately very important to become a profitable photographer? To become a profitable photographer, you have to separate yourself from those who love this art and craft of photography, don't intend to make it a business, they're giving away their work, and they don't know what to do or how to do it. All they know is people like their sunsets, so can you come photograph my baby, and what are your, what are your fees going to be? So photographing and being paid and taking money for these jobs, you have to create such a, a gap between you and those photographers that there can't be any blurring of the lines, so to speak. And when I say that, and when I talk about quality like this in my workshops, I'm talking about the quality of the imagery certainly has to be there. But there's a whole world of the quality of the person that you are and the quality of, you know, the condition of your equipment, the condition of your car when you pull up in front of a church and you're about to photograph a Six thousand or a twenty thousand dollar wedding. Did you wash your car before you went to the church? Mm -hmm. Will people notice that you didn't polish your shoes? Everything about you, your logo, your brand, your website, how you shake hands, how you look. Did you get? Did you shave? Did you bother putting on a tie? Every single thing plays into you and your brand that you're creating. Now there are an awful lot of people that have a great eye that can take great great pictures but they haven't figured this part out yet. And, and they don't know, they don't know what they don't know. And they don't know the, the boat that they might be missing by missing out on ways to separate themselves, which then does give them the opportunity for good, profitable business skills. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of great photographers that are starving out there. Right. First off, they're afraid to charge more, but second off, they have no idea that they look like a slob when they go to work. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times back when I did weddings, the church coordinators particularly would say, oh my gosh, you are dressed so professionally. You would not believe what most photographers look like when they show up here to do a wedding. I think that's right. And I, you know, I used to make jokes about that, how, you know, we want to be thought of as doctors and lawyers and dentists and, and be as professional as possible. And then we show up like, you know, the guy with holes in his jeans from the newspaper with five cameras hanging off his neck. Right. Or, sorry, if any of the listeners love their leggings and their short tops with their leggings, but I really feel that even though we're crawling around in the mud wrangling babies or dogs or whatever, there's a way to dress that is different than what the people who are doing this as a side gig for a little bit of money that, you know, in everything we do, which is what I hear you saying, be different. So if all the gals who are doing, you know, two, $300 shit and burns are in their Lululemon leggings and flip-flops, then be the one that surprises the client because you're in, you know, maybe a knit pant that's just as comfortable, but, but looks like, like pants. And, and, your nail, and your nails are done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? A little bit of makeup, a little bit of jewelry. Um, you know, I dress, I feel like I'm in pajamas, but, you know, one of the, one of the presidential candidates wears a black pants and a black shirt and then a cute jacket. And that's sort of been my professional uniform for years. Sure, sure. And now, you know, I'm not, I'm not 30. So I, you know, it's, it's not super stylish. I mean, when in doubt, all black, 
even if it's a black t-shirt and black pants and you know, that always goes over well. And the main thing is to just be aware, right. you know, right. I heard, I heard, uh, I'm a big fan of Tim and Bev Walden in, in Kentucky. Yes. I get to have them on my show soon. Oh, they're great. And, and I heard Tim say one time to a crowd, he said, create bigger gaps. You want to be successful than more successful than anybody else in your area, in your community, create bigger gaps between you and all of those other guys. Right. And that's gaps in your marketing, gaps in your logo, gaps in your pricing, gaps in your quality, right. gaps in how you talk to the clients, every single aspect of it. Yes. I just had an aha on that, that by changing a pricing structure from the shoot and share, even if you're charging thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> or $200, being the photographer in your area that sells products, that your prices are higher, the entry point is higher, that separates you and gets people's attention that there's something different about you. Now, being able to address the, well, everybody else, you know, charges $300 and get on the file, get all the files. Well, you need to have some good answers for that. Well, you do. You do. And, and you're establishing what the value is of that product, whether it's a digital file or a 30 by 40 print on the wall you're in charge of putting that value, that dollar value on that product. Right. And if you devalue that digital file, we had a local guy. Let me just give you a little example. There's a local guy who uh, shall remain nameless, but he really is wanting to become a full-time professional photographer. And he's been coming by the studio. He lives here locally. He comes by and has coffee with me at the studio. And I found out the other day, he, I'm, I'm trying to get him to, really consider becoming a professional here. And here's what you have to know. And here's some of the things that you need to do. And he goes and photographs a, a, a high school a football game, a basketball game, and put all the files on his website. And you can download them as parents. You can download them for a dollar a piece. <laughs> and, and I just, and he walked back in the other day and I just looked at him and I shook my head and I said, you're going to kill us. <laughs> And we're going to kill you because yeah. <laughs> you just told these clients what the value is of that image, that it's only worth about a dollar. Yeah. So, ooh, maybe he made $10 because... So he might have made $10. Yeah. And so by having pricing that is different than others and at a professional level, then it communicates that you know what you're doing. So no matter how great you are, I would not hire a dollar photographer or a hundred dollar photographer, unless you know, like it's a friend of mine and we're just doing it for fun. But in general, looking for a pro, no matter how good someone is, if their pricing is not at a professional level, I would never hire them. It raises a red flag to you as a consumer. Right. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. Somebody that um, is a magnificent photographer who was inquiring about having me coach. When I first looked at his work, I thought maybe it wasn't his work because of he had shared how long he'd actually been officially in business. Then I learned that he's been working at being a beautiful photographer for a number of years and very like everybody knows who he is and he's now ready to build a business. But, you know, so do you get what I'm saying on that, Tony? I do. Yeah, yeah. Sure. That, that I had to like research just a little more to, you know, unequivocally learn that this guy is just an amazing fine art photographer who's now going to sell it, which is why, you know, he needs support in building the business side. He doesn't need help with the photography. He's trying to do it the right way. He's yeah. trying. He's, you've got to start with the foundation of the craft of photography and then build on top of that. Right. And he has a, a job. So he has not needed to build a business yet, but you know, he's wants to build his future in photography. So it's really exciting to get to have somebody where the craft, you know, check. Absolutely. <laughs> now, where do we go from here? So we are running somewhat out of time. Although if we just keep talking for another three hours, I'll just make this, <laughs> I'll make this four episodes and it'll just be the Tony show. Hey, and, I, and I'll come back and be on with you anytime. You know that. Good, good. Is there anything else 
that you feel people really need to know or understand? I, I do want to, I, I had a thought when we were finishing up that topic on pricing and, and shoot and burns. It's inevitable. People are going to want digital files. There are people that will come to you and that's all they want are the digital files. And I think that as a working pro, you, you have a responsibility to teach them what they're missing because they don't know what they're missing. Yes. They don't know that in 12, 14 years, whatever device it's stored on, they can't open or read ever again. They don't know that they're gonna, their kid's going to step on a CD or DVD in the kitchen and break that in half and that those images are gone. They don't know what they don't know. And there's almost no technology anymore. Like I have one computer that I can read a CD on and a DVD. Yeah. That's it's all changing and, it's, and it will continue to change forever. Right. But I think if, if people come to you for that, for example, M- Mandy's got a digital package on her portrait session. If, you are, if, she's, if she's doing your family portrait or your high school senior portrait, she has a digital package. Oh, but by the way, it comes with a photo box filled with prints. Right. She will not sell the digital files without also making prints. So there, it's, you're going to get the prints whether you ask for them or not. You're going to get the print. Yeah. I, I, I love that. If I were to sell digital files, it would include one wall portrait and two sets of, let's say, 20 you yeah. know, the, the best 20, two sets of five by sevens so that then they can also have things to give away so that they find no need to go to some bad printer. <laughs> that's it. And that's what she does. Hers is, I think hers is 30, 30 prints and she retouches them and they're, they're, they're quality yeah. prints and they're a beautiful, beautiful box. I, I suggest two sets of that. It doesn't cost us much to mm-hmm. make a second print so that then she, then she can give them away and they still get to keep all of them, but then they don't accidentally go somewhere and have copies made for their mom that look bad. So great and, idea. And because I love wall portraits, I would have to include at least anything, any size they wanted up to a 30 by 40. Sure. And sure. And it would all be priced accordingly, but I don't do that. But if I did, that's what I would <laughs> that's do. What you're gonna do. <laughs> that's what I would do. Or make it a purchase with purchase, where once they invest a certain amount, a big amount, then they can add it, do an add-on for a small price. Oh, gosh, Tony, are you going to WPPI? I am. I'm actually print judging on Sunday and Monday, and then I'm doing portfolio reviews on Tuesday morning, and yeah, so I'm going to be over there. Good. Well, then we get to hang out and I will hug you on behalf of all the listeners who are now as crazy about you as I am. <laughs> yeah, send me a link for the show when you have one and I will, uh, I will tweet it out, Instagram it out and Facebook it everywhere. Awesome. So how do people get in touch with you, my friend? My best contact is probably my, my email address, which is Tony at TonyCorbell.com, C-O-R-B-E-L-L.com. I'm pretty good with getting back to people with, with email questions. Okay. My phone doesn't work because I'm always either getting on a plane or getting off of a plane and just, I can't, I just can't keep up with phone calls. And then you have a, you have a website, Tony Corbell. Yep. Tony Corbell.com. Cool. Yep. And that's got my workshop schedules and everything that's going on in, in our lives. Cool. So stay tuned for my wrap up, darling listeners. And Tony, this has just been such a delight. And I can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks. Sounds great. Lucy, thank you so much for doing this. And uh, I'm so glad we finally found a day that worked. I know. Uh, <laughs> we wanted to do this for a while, since yeah, last summer. <laughs> since June. And yeah. <laughs> did, did you hear me say that so far I've had almost, well, I've had over 12,000 downloads in th- 42 countries? That's fantastic. So fantastic. people. Congratulations. I, well, thank you, everyone who is listening. And thank you also for sharing this with your friends and going to iTunes to review because, uh, you know, I have a goal of many, many, many more people finding the show so that they can learn and grow from people like Tony. So sharing is caring and it's very, very appreciated. So, well, okie doke. Thanks, Tony. Great, great, great to talk to you. Thank you so much. 
Wow, that was such a great conversation. And I know I learned a lot and Tony has such a great way of putting everything. So some of the things that I, you know, pulled out of this is, first of all, with lighting, we want to look at both the light and the shadow. And so we can either add a light source or use available light. We can subtract light and we can find ambient light. And how he explained ambient light is that it's, it's light that could come from all kinds of different sources. You know, the, the light from a television, the, the light as you're holding your iPad, uh, a light in a hotel, you know, in the hallway. We can use those for lighting. We also talked about the importance of being excellent in everything we do. Ultimate quality is something that he's really shares about the quality of our work, mastering photography, knowing our skills, but also including how we dress, how we speak, how our our website, our logo, our pricing system, all of that. And I also love how he shared that we need to show up ready and able to do the job as a professional. We need to learn our craft so we have confidence. And he said, this was an old commercial, don't let him see you sweat. So, you know, the importance of, of knowing our tools. And we talked about a meter. And if people have never used a handheld meter, you know, back in the film days, Professionals did not have cameras that had automatic metering much at all. You know, the working professionals, we were using medium format, uh, let's say for weddings and portraits. And so we had to have a meter because also we couldn't chimp on the back. Chimping is where you look at the back of your your camera and go, ooh, 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 ooh. (laughs) I don't know who coined that. So learning how to use your meter particularly if you're going to be using any kind of additive lighting, you know, flash or strobes or, you know, eh, not flashlights, but well, yes, that could help too. So anyway, it was a delight. Thank you for listening to the show. I've gotten some really great comments lately and it is such a treat to then be able to share the people that I value in this industry that have a lot to share with the world. Oh, he also had some good stories about celebrities and the value of making friends and teaching in order to be visible, to have opportunities show up. So that's it for now. Look forward to next week and um, I'm sending you a big, big virtual hug. Bye now. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.